Hello, welcome back to the series of lectures on organic chemistry, the fundamental aspects of organic chemistry. The basic principles of organic chemistry is what is being discussed. In this module, we will discuss two important aspects in organic chemistry. One is purification of organic compounds. The second one is identification of elements present in organic compound. Let us say for example, a scientist synthesizes an organic molecule in the laboratory, a new organic molecule in the laboratory. It is important that the scientist purifies the organic compound to the highest purity that is possible. So, purification methods are extremely important in the practice of organic chemistry. Now, having synthesized the molecule, he has the reason to identify the compound in terms of its elemental composition, in terms of its structure and so on. What we will deal with in this particular module is some processes which are used in the purification of organic compounds. Unless otherwise the organic compound is pure, one cannot determine the elemental composition of an impure substance. So, it is necessary to purify the compounds. After purification, it is essential to identify the presence of various elements and elemental composition in an organic compound and that is usually carried out by various chemical tests carried out on the organic compound. Let us start with the purification of organic compounds. This is going to be fairly descriptive in nature because of the fact that many of these procedures are discussed in the textbook and the diagrams related to the various methodology you can refer to the textbook also. One is sublimation. Sublimation is a phase transformation when a solid compound is heated even before it melts it goes into the gas phase and sublimes. So, if you take something like naphthalene for example, if you heat naphthalene, naphthalene does not melt even before it melts the vapor pressure of the solid itself is sufficiently high for it to undergo vaporization to go to the vapor compound, vapor phase and the vapor phase can be conduct condensed on a cold surface. So, what is normally done is to take in a stand a petri dish containing naphthalene and the petri dish is covered with a funnel by inverting the funnel upside down onto the petri dish and the compound is gently heated from the below using a Bunsen burner or a heater for example. When the substance is heated, if it is a sublimable substance, the substance is sublimable provided it goes from the solid phase to the directly to the vapor phase without melting. In other words, the vapor pressure of the solid is sufficiently high at this particular temperature to which is it heated. So, it directly goes into the vapor phase before it becomes a liquid phase for example. When the vapors reach the colder surfaces of the funnel, the crystallization process will take place essentially. So, the funnel stem and the funnel surface is going to be now covered with crystals of naphthalene. So, this is a process by which some of the organic substances are benzoic acid, naphthalene, they all can be sublimed for example using the sublimator that is shown here. Often time it may not be enough if you just leave an inverted funnel like this. There are other sublimation apparatus which are let us say an outer jar is there and this is covered and then you have a inner tube that is inserted into the jar all the way down to the bottom. The substance to be sublimed is taken in the outer jar like this 
and the inner jar has a water circulating unit. all the way down here. So, cold water is sent here and it comes out of here. So, the surface of the glass in the inner tube is continuously cooled by means of water circulation or chilled water circulation. This is a sublimation tube that is normally used for example. So, sublimation is essentially going from solid to vapor and the condensation of the vapor back to solid. So, the typical example that is shown is if the naphthalene is contaminated with a little bit of silica or sand or some such substance, sand and silica are not sublimable, they are high melting solids. So, when you heat a mixture of sand and naphthalene, only naphthalene will sublime and you get pure naphthalene deposited on the funnel surface or in the inner tube surface. Here the vapor will essentially condense on the outside of the inner tube. The inner tube can be removed and this material can be scrapped off after the sublimation is over. The second process is crystallization. This is the most popular methodology to purify solids, organic solids. Crystallization is a process in which the substance which is a solid substance is dissolved in a suitable solvent, it could be water or an organic solvent such that it is not highly soluble in that particular solvent. It should be highly soluble at a high temperature ideally and when it is cooled it should be insoluble in nature. <coughs> and typically the impurities should be highly soluble in the solvent of choice. So, if you take for example, something like benzoic acid, benzoic acid can be dissolved in boiling water. So, when you boil water and add solid material of benzoic acid to it, initially it will be floating around, slowly it will go into solution and it will dissolve in the water and when the water is cooled, it will reappear as crystalline solid. So, what is normally done is under the hot condition the solution of benzoic acid in water is quickly filtered to remove any suspended impurities and once the filtrate is collected, filtrate is the one that is filtered through a funnel for example, with the filter paper. It is filtered through the funnel into a beaker and the solution that you get here is what is known as filtrate. When the filtrate is cooled to room temperature, crystals of benzoic acid appears again. So, if you take a impure benzoic acid, one can easily purify it by crystallization. By far, crystallization is one of the best methods of purifying an organic sol solid. The only problem is one needs to identify a suitable solvent in which it is soluble at high temperature, but insoluble at lower temperature so that one can effectively do this. Picric acid for example, can be crystallized from water. So, these are some methods of purification of organic compounds. The third methodology is distillation methodology. Distillation essentially involves boiling a liquid. This is a methodology for purification of liquids. When the liquid is heated to its boiling point, in other words, when the vapor pressure of the on the surface of the liquid equals to the atmospheric pressure, liquid starts to boil and produce vapor and the vapor is condensed again using a cold condenser and this process is what is known as distillation. Distillation, there are several different types of distillation known. One is a normal pressure distillation. That means, the liquid is heated in the atmospheric pressure itself until it reaches its boiling point. The vapors are condensed using a condenser and that is a normal pressure distillation or ordinary distillation. 
the second distillation is vacuum distillation. Here using a vacuum pump, a low pressure is applied on to the reaction distillation unit. Let us say for example, you have a distillation unit which is consisting of the flask containing the liquid and having a condenser attached to it. And you have a receiver flask here for example. In this portion you apply vacuum, in other words connect it to a vacuum pump, so that the air inside the flask is sucked out and there is a low pressure that is created here. Why do we need to do a vacuum distillation? Some of the organic compounds when it reaches its boiling point it undergoes decomposition, even before it reaches its boiling point it can undergo decomposition. And some of the organic compounds may be dangerous to heat to high temperature because it may catch fire and so on. So for these two reasons, if the pressure in the reaction still or the distillation still is kept at a lower level, then the vapor pressure is reached to the applied pressure of the applied vacuum of the system even at a lower temperature. In other words, the liquid boils at a lower temperature at reduced pressure. Let us say for example, I have a vessel here like this and this is maintained at atmospheric pressure. When will the liquid boil? The liquid will boil when the vapor pressure at the surface of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure. The at that particular temperature, the liquid will start boiling. In other words, the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, the liquid will start boiling. Suppose if it is not atmospheric pressure, it is less than atmospheric pressure. Then the temperature will also be lower because at a lower temperature itself, it will reach the pressure that is being applied or the vacuum that is being applied. So that is a basic principle of the vacuum distillation. In other words, distillation of an organic compound which normally will decompose at its boiling point. To make it distill at a lower temperature, we apply vacuum and reduced to pressure distillation is what is known as the vacuum distillation. The third distillation is known as fractional distillation. Let us say for example, we have a mixture of two compounds. Let us say a mixture of benzene which is has a boiling point of 80 degrees or so and xylene which has a boiling point of about 110 or 120 is centigrade or so. Now these two liquids are miscible, let us say by accidentally you have mixed it or you have a mixture of these two compounds, you want to separate them. One can distill this compound under fractional distillation condition such that the low boiling liquid is obtained first as a fraction and then you heat it to a higher temperature and get the high boiling liquid as a second fraction. In other words, based on the boiling point difference, if they are very widely different in their boiling point, then it is easy to do a fractional distillation. Even if they are closely closed in terms of their boiling points, it is possible to do a fractional distillation provided you have a fractionating column. <coughs> what is a fractionating column? A fractionating column is nothing but a tube that is filled with beads, glass beads of this kind and this is connected to the flask, distillation flask where the liquid is taken for example. This is completely filled with the glass beads, this is open here, put some cotton plug or something and fill it up with the glass beads in this particular way. So there is a lot of obstruction for the vapor to pass through this, this is connected to a condenser as usual. So what happens, the liquid starts to boil, 
the vapor pressure of the lower boiling liquid is going to be higher in the vapor phase compared to the vapor pressure of the low higher boiling liquid for example, because there is a differential in their boiling point. So, the one that is boiling at a lower temperature that vapor will rise, it will keep condensing until it rises to this level and then the distillation of that lower boiling fraction will take place. In other words, based on the boiling point difference, you are selectively distilling off the more volatile compound in this particular instance benzene and compared to the less volatile compound which is xylene in this particular case. So, this is the basic principle of the fractional distillation setup. Finally, you also have steam distillation. Steam distillation is a very favorite method for isolation of terpenoid compounds from plant materials. For example, I want to distill off lemonine from lemon, peels of lemon has what is known as lemonine, sorry. And suppose I want to isolate the lemonine from the peels of lemon or peels of orange, it is ideal to do a steam distillation unit. Steam distillation is also useful when a compound is steam volatile in nature. In other words, at the, at the steam temperature, it has sufficient vapor pressure to form the vapors and the vapors are condensed to using a condenser during the process of distillation. So, there are several organic compounds which are steam distillable. As usual, if it is applied pressure, then a pressure corresponding to the water vapor and the partial pressure corresponding to the organics also. So, this is water vapor pressure and this is the organic compound vapor pressure. This will be the total pressure in a steam distillation unit. So, when the molecule, when the temperature reaches the applied pressure, it will contains both the vapor of the water as well as the vapor of the organic molecule and it is being condensed. Organic molecule of course, is invisible with water. So, at the receiver, you will receive a mixture of water as well as the organic compound and that is to be separated by means of a separating funnel in the process of separation is done at the, at the using a separating funnel in the process of isolating the pure organic compound from the water fraction that is being separated. The fourth methodology is an extraction methodology. This is useful if two organic compounds are let us say mixed together and based on their chemical property one can separate one from the other by selective extraction process. I will give you an example of let us say benzene and benzoic acid are mixed together. In other words, a solution of benzene is given. One can do simply removal of the benzene by distillation and get the benzoic acid. So, that is by means of distillation of benzene one can get the benzoic acid. Alternatively, one can also extract the benzoic acid out of the mixture. In this mixture, exploit the acidic property of benzoic acid. So, what is done is normally a separating funnel is taken for example. The solution containing benzene and benzoic acid is taken here to which now you add aqueous sodium bicarbonate. Aqueous sodium bicarbonate when it adds, it will form another layer, this will form the lower layer. Water is heavier than benzene. So, the upper layer will be benzene containing the benzoic acid and the lower layer will be aqueous bicarbonate solution. What will happen when you mix this together and shake it up and mix it together? The benzoic acid will essentially react with the aqueous bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate to form sodium benzoate which is water soluble because it is a sodium salt. 
So, you will start extracting the benzoic acid from the benzene solution into the aqueous layer solution and then allow it to settle the aqueous layer will separate in the lower layer. So, it will contain the sodium benzoate the upper layer will have benzene for example and if you just drain off the lower layer by separating the layer corresponding to the lower portion of the two layers you will get in the beaker the lower layer containing sodium benzoate. Now, if you add hydrochloric acid benzoic acid will come out of the aqueous phase. So, this when you add hydrochloric acid after separation of the two layers it will regenerate benzoic acid sodium chloride of course, water soluble. So, the upper layer will be in the flask itself in the separating funnel itself that will contain benzene the lower layer which is the aqueous layer contains the sodium salt of benzoic acid which on acidification gives you benzoic acid. If you have a mixture of aniline and benzoic acid the same methodology can be used aniline is basic benzoic acid is acidic. So, you can either extract it with the hydrochloric acid to selectively remove aniline or you can extract it with benz sodium bicarbonate to selectively extract the benzoic acid out. So, selective extraction is the methodology that is used for this type of separation. The last but the most important technique is chromatography. Chromatography essentially operates on a principle of having two phases one is a solid stationary phase the other one is a mobile phase we are talking about column chromatography for the separation of mixture of organic compounds. Now, if a methodology cannot be adopted based on sublimation crystallization distillation or extraction the final point is that you can separate them using chromatography. This is there are two types column chromatography and paper chromatography. and thin layer chromatography. Let us say for example, we do an organic reaction you end up with a mixture of compounds and that is not easily separable by any one of this methodology what is normally done is in a long burette kind of a apparatus which is known as the column this is plugged with some kind of a cotton or glass wool here to close the not permanently close it, but make it permeable only to the liquid, but not to the solids and fill it up with silica gel or alumina silica gel is SiO2 alumina is Al2O3 these are most commonly used stationary phase material in a in other words these are immobile phase that you have here. Then a solution of the organic compound which is a mixture of organic compounds is applied to the top of the silica gel. So, this now essentially contains a mixture of organic compounds let us say the mixture of organic compounds are mixture of dyes. So, that you have a red colored dye mixed with for example, a blue colored dye in this particular instance. Now, a suitable solvent is chosen and it is these compounds are eluted through the column using this. Now, there is a chemi adsorption of the organic molecule onto the silica. Silica surface is full of hydroxy functional group. Similarly, alumina surface is also full of hydroxy functional group. So, there is a hydrogen bonding interaction and a weak interaction between the organic compound and this solid phase or the stationary phase. And when the solvent passes through, 
these compounds are eluted because these compounds have certain solubility in the, so you are essentially partitioning the organic compound between the mobile phase which is the liquid phase that is passing through and the solid phase. In the absence of any mobile phase, this will be permanently adhered to the solid surface. Now you are partitioning because of the solubility of the organic compound in the mobile phase, you are partitioning it through the mobile phase. So over a period of time, the two molecules may have different polarity to start with and the one that is more polar is going to strongly stick to the silica gel other one that is going to be less polar is going to be eluted faster. So let us assume the red compound is the one that is less polar in nature. So that is going to be eluted first in the form of a band like this and the blue compound which is more polar is going to be eluted slower. So you are going to see two bands corresponding to the red compound and the blue compound separating like this. So if you elute it with more and more solvent, the first compound that is going to come out is the red compound followed by the second compound. So if you have a mixture of n number of compounds, you can still separate it by means of a column chromatography. The basic principle is essentially same in the paper chromatography except paper cellulose is used as a solid stationary phase. So you have a beaker and in the beaker you suspend a piece of paper and you spot the organic compound mixture on the bottom of the paper and then fill this with a little bit of solvent that to be eluted and the solvent essentially goes up because of the capillary action on the paper and that is a mobile phase and when it moves for example, it eludes the organic compound. So if you have a mixture of let us say a blue spot and a red spot spotted together, let us assume that the blue spot is a less polar spot that will move faster and the red spot is a more polar spot that will elude slower in this particular case. So as a result of that, the two spots can be seen very clearly by means of a paper chromatography. So when you are doing an organic reaction, if you want to follow the organic reaction, this is for bulk separation. One can do gram quantities of separation of organic compounds using column chromatography. It only depends on what size of the burette you take or what size of the tube you take with the diameter of the tube that you take. You can pack as much of silica gel as possible and load the compound and elute the compound to separate them properly in this manner. Now on a glass plate or on an aluminum sheet, if a thin layer of silica gel or alumina is coated, then it would constitute the thin layer chromatography. So the thin layer chromatography essentially you have a strip of paper, sorry not paper, a strip of glass or an aluminum sheet on which a millimeter thickness of the silica or alumina is coated and this is kept inside a jar and let us say it is goes to the bottom of the jar like this and a small amount of solvent is taken. The solvent essentially move upwards because of the capillary action again and if the compounds are spotted here, essentially you can move the solvent all the way up to here let us say for example. So this is a solvent front and this is the origin where the compound is spotted and during the elution, the molecule let us say moves up to this point here. So this distance here is let us say L and this solvent distance is about M. In other words, the solvent has moved up to M millimeters whereas the compound has moved only up to L millimeter. The retention factor is defined as the length to which the compound has moved divided by the length to which the solvent has moved for example. This would correspond to the <coughs> thin layer chromatography. Basic principle is essentially same, you have a differential adsorption of the compound onto the solid surface which is a thin layer of silica or alumina on an aluminum plate or a glass plate and the solvent is eluted from the bottom up in this particular case <coughs> compared to top down in the column chromatography. The solvent is poured from the top and collected in the bottom in the column chromatography whereas solvent is taken in the bottom and it is eluted 
to give the chromatographic pattern of organic compounds and the retention factor is essentially a parameter which identifies for a given solvent system how much is the distance that is travelled by the compound in comparison to the distance travelled by the solvent itself up to the solvent front. So, these are some methodologies by which compounds can be purified in organic chemistry. Now, let us move on to determination of elemental composition of organic compounds using simple methodology. Let us say for example, organic compounds generally contain carbon and hydrogen. So, one does not want to test for carbon and hydrogen. One can indeed test for carbon and hydrogen in an organic compound, but it is not necessary because when you say organic compound invariably it will have carbon and hydrogen in its composition. However, if you take an organic compound containing carbon and hydrogen, if you mix it with cupric oxide in the presence of oxygen and heat it strongly, it will form carbon dioxide and water. In other words, you completely oxidize the organic compound at a high temperature, the corresponding oxidized product, the hydrogen present in the organic compound becomes water during oxidation and the carbon present in the organic compound becomes carbon dioxide. This can be tested with lime water. And this can be tested with calcium chloride anhydrous. Anhydrous calcium chloride absorbs water. So, the weight of the calcium chloride will essentially increase during the process. What if the organic compound also has other elements namely nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus and halogen. Let us take for example, a compound has both carbon, hydrogen and the nitrogen. How do we identify the presence of nitrogen is the test what is known as Lessines test. This is also known as sodium fusion test. Let us take a compound like this. This has nitrogen, there are two nitrogens present in this compound, let us say. Carbon hydrogen is there, nitrogen is also there, but then the nitrogen is in the form of an organic nitrogen in this particular compound. It is not an ionic substance, it is a neutral nitrogen is what is being present in this particular system. So, when an organic compound containing nitrogen is strongly heated with sodium, it turns the nitrogenous content into cyanide because of the presence of carbon and nitrogen. So, sodium cyanide is what is produced during the course of this. In other words, the sodium fusion test essentially allows you to convert the nitrogen content of the organic compound into an inorganic nitrogen compound namely the sodium cyanide. Sodium cyanide can be easily tested by. So, with the excess of sodium, you heat it to high temperature and fuse it. In other words, you melt the sodium in a small tube along with the organic compound to high temperature and suddenly plunge the tube, te test tube into water so that you form sodium hydroxide and sodium cyanide in the process. Now, this is called the sodium fusion extract. Sodium fusion extract is always alkaline because of the excess of sulf sodium that is being taken which will react with water. So, first it is fused with sodium, secondly water is added or it is added to water. The sodium fusion tube is plunged into water and the tube red hot tube essentially breaks and the excess sodium reacts with water to give sodium hydroxide and the organic nitrogen content becomes turns into sodium cyanide. So, now what is done is ferrous sulphate is added and boiled. Under alkaline condition, if you boil ferrous sulphate with sodium cyanide, it will form
ferrocyanide as the species. Now, the boiling ferrous sulphate also under aerial condition gets oxidized to ferric sulphate. So, a small amount of ferric hydroxide will also be formed. So, the ferrous and the ferric they combine together forming a ferric ferrocyanide is being formed and this is deep blue in color. It is called a Prussian blue. So, after the sodium fusion extract is over, it is boiled with ferrous sulphate and then it is acidified with the dilute sulphuric acid. Dilute sulphuric acid is necessary to get rid of the sodium hydroxide in this particular extraction process. So, the sodium fusion extract is first boiled with sodium sulf ferrous sulphate and neutralized the excess sodium hydroxide with the dilute sulphuric acid. Upon neutralization, one produces a deep blue color or what is known as the Prussian blue color, which is an indication. The presence of the Prussian blue color is an indication of the. So, the overall reaction is carbon and nitrogen in the presence of sodium forms sodium cyanide. Sodium cyanide with ferrous sulphate essentially produces ferrocyanide. You can balance these equations yourself. Ferrous sulphate gets oxidized to ferric sulphate. The ferric sulphate that is formed reacts with ferrocyanide forming the ferric ferrocyanide as the final product and this is blue in color. All the equations needs to be balanced which you can do it yourself. So, the Prussian blue color is the appearance of the Prussian blue color is indication of the presence of nitrogen in an organic compound. The basic principle is simple, the inorganic nitrogen is converted into inorganic cyanide and the cyanide is essentially tested by the iron complex which is shown there. Suppose sulphur is also present in the organic compound, in the sodium fusion extraction it will not give cyanide, it will give sodium thiocyanide. The thodium thiocyanide on reaction with ferric sulphate produces a blood red color of this particular species. Hexathiocyanotoferrate is what is being formed and this has blood red color. The presence of a blood red color in the lecine stress is an indication that you not only have nitrogen, but also sulfur that is present in the system. Suppose if only sulfur is present in the system, then the carbon sulfur using sodium fusion test will produce sodium sulphide. So, organic sulphur compound is converted into inorganic system. A good example of sulphur compound will be let us say this 3 sulphur containing compound when it is heated with sodium sulphide, sodium metal when it is fused with sodium metal it produces a sodium sulphide as the inorganic sulphur containing compound. The inorganic sulphur containing compound can be tested by means of sodium nitroprusside. Sodium nitroprusside is essentially Na2 
f e c n 5 n o. So, this is sodium nitroprusside when it reacts with the sodium sulphide it essentially produces N A 2 F E C N 5 N S O N O S and this is supposed to be purple or violet in color. So, the sodium nitroprusside test gives a very violet color in the presence of indicating the presence of sulphide. Sodium sulphide can also be tested by lead acetate in other words the sodium fusion extract is taken and it is neutralized with acetic acid and then lead acetate is added. If you add a lead acetate directly lead hydroxide will precipitate. So, it should not happen this is neutralized with acetic acid to generate the sodium sulphide and sodium acetate. Then if lead acetate is added the black precipitate of lead sulphide is an indication of the presence of sulphur in the organic compound. So, we have seen the detection of nitrogen we have seen the detection of both nitrogen and sulphur being present together and we have seen the detection of sulphur itself in the organic compound. Now, what is left is halogen. Now, in the sodium fusion extract in the sodium fusion test if halogen like chlorine, bromine, iodine are also present in the organic compound let us say bromobenzene or chlorobenzene is the compound that we are dealing with. So, let us call this as x, x is equal to bromine, chlorine or iodine as the case may be. During the course of the sodium fusion extract it will form sodium halide. So, one has to test now for halogen the simplest test one can do is this is of course, in the presence of sodium hydroxide because of the excess sodium that is present in the sodium fusion extract. So, neutralize it with dilute nitric acid. So, that all the sodium hydroxide is converted into sodium nitrite and then add silver nitrate. This is important to neutralize with nitric acid otherwise if you add silver nitrate directly to the sodium fusion extract silver hydroxide and silver oxide will precipitate itself. So, that would be problematic situation in this. So, the silver halide precipitate is obtained if you get a white precipitate that is soluble in ammonia then it is called the silver chloride test x is equal to chlorine x is equal to bromine you get a pale yellow precipitate partially soluble in ammonia finally, x is equal to iodine dark yellow precipitate which is insoluble in ammonia this is an indication. So, if it is a chloride that is present you get a white precipitate which is soluble in ammonia if it is bromide you get a yellow precipitate of silver bromide which is partially soluble in ammonia if it is an iodide you get a dark yellow precipitate of silver iodide which is completely insoluble in ammonia for example. So, one can determine the presence of any halogen that is present in the organic compound by means of a sodium fusion test. Only thing one needs to remember is before adding silver nitrate to a sodium fusion extract one needs to neutralize it with nitric acid. So, that the sodium hydroxide excess does not react with the silver nitrate and it is completely neutralized to sodium nitrate in the process of treating with the dilute nitric acid. Phosphorus is not a very common element in organic compounds, but it can be present in organic compound. Phosphorus is essentially tested by the sodium fusion extract. If phosphorus is present in the form of a organic phosphine 
let us say for example, this is an organic phosphorus compound. Several pesticides and insecticides have organic phosphorus compound. This is triphenyl phosphine. This is triethyl phosphate for example. These are all examples of organophosphorus compounds. If phosphorus is present in the system, this is first treated with sodium peroxide so that one produces sodium phosphate which is an inorganic phosphate. The phosphorus is completely oxidized in its organic state to the ionizable phosphate state and sodium phosphate can be detected by means of ammonium molybdate. This is treated with nitric acid to produce phosphoric acid and the phosphoric acid is what is detected by means of a this is ammonium molybdate. Ammonium molybdate gives a nice yellow precipitate of ammonium phosphomolybdate. Ammonium phosphomolybdate has the molecular formula which is this. MOO3. It is a fairly complex molecule. The important point is that it gives a yellow coloration or yellow precipitate when ammonium molybdate is added to phosphoric acid solution. Ammonium phosphomolybdate is what is formed which is responsible for the yellow color that we see in this kind of a situation. Now having found out a methodology for the detection of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, halogen, phosphorus and so on in organic compound. One can have an idea of what class of an organic compound it is, whether it is a nitrogenous compound, whether it is a sulfur compound, whether it is a halogenated compound or a phosphorus containing compound. But then more important thing is to estimate the amount of this elements that are present in an organic compound for example. This is extremely important. This is carried out by what is known as elemental analysis, quantitative elemental analysis of organic compounds. Let us say for example, the limonene which is present in lemon as well as in orange is isolated by steam distillation and we have a very pure lemon in, we want to find out what is its elemental composition. The elemental composition of lemon in is C10 H16. So we do not know to start with what is the elemental composition of lemon in, but from the sodium fusion test we know that nitrogen is absent, sulfur is absent, halogen is absent as well as phosphorus is absent. Oxygen is generally not detected by means of elemental test because the total percentage of other elements minus 100 essentially gives the percentage of oxygen if at all oxygen is present in the compound. Let us say for example, this is the elemental composition of lemonine which we do not know. We need to find out what is X and what is Y. What is done is the organic compound is treated with copper oxide in the presence of a dry oxygen. In the process you essentially catalytically convert all of the carbon into carbon dioxide, all of the hydrogen into water in the process of decomposition or the process of elemental composition determination. It is absorbed onto anhydrous calcium chloride. So you take a certain weight of calcium chloride, after the all the water that is produced is passed through the calcium chloride tube, you weigh it again, it will tell you the difference will tell you, the weight difference will tell you the amount of water that is being generated. In this particular case, 
this is passed through the solution of sodium hydroxide. So, that the carbon dioxide essentially reacts with sodium hydroxide to produce sodium carbonate which is estimated. So, one can estimate the amount of carbon dioxide that is produced as well as the amount of water that is produced in this. Let us say for example, x grams of CO2 is produced and y grams of water is produced from m grams of the substance. Initial weight of the substance taken is m grams, let us say. Now, we know that carbon dioxide molecular weight is 44 and it has one carbon, so it corresponds to 12. So, 44 grams of carbon dioxide if it is formed, it corresponds to 12 grams of carbon. If x grams of carbon dioxide is formed in the reaction, then it would correspond to this much amount of the carbon that is present in the system. This much amount of carbon is present in the m grams of the starting material. So, from how many to want to calculate the percentage of carbon in the organic compound one has to use this formula. It is very simple. Carbon dioxide has one carbon which is 44 molecular weight out of which 12 is corresponding to the carbon and 32 corresponds to the oxygen. We are not concerned about oxygen at this point of time. It is a carbon amount that we need to find out. If you want to find out out of 44 car grams of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, 12 grams corresponds to the carbon. So, if x grams of carbon dioxide is formed, how much will would have been the carbon amount in the carbon dioxide that is produced? That is produced from m grams of the starting material, initial amount of the various substance that is taken. So, in m grams of the starting material, this much amount of carbon is present. So, 100 grams of carbon, 100 grams of the material, how much amount of the carbon is present? This would correspond to the percentage content of carbon in the system. Similarly, if you have water, 18 grams of water has 2 grams of, so the percentage of hydrogen in the molecule would correspond to, for 18 grams you have 2 grams of water, y gram is actually formed, the water amount that is formed is y grams and that is formed from m grams of the initial starting material. So, for 100 grams of initial starting material, what would be the presence of hydrogen in the system? So, this would correspond to essentially the percentage of hydrogen that is formed in this reaction. Let me illustrate it with one example of Let us say for example, we burn butane or we catalytically convert butane into carbon dioxide and let us say 0.5 grams of SCN HM is burnt. We do not know what is M and M. We need to find out the, but we know it is a hydrocarbon molecule. If it gives for example, 1.517 grams of CO2 and 0.776 grams of water is produced in the process. Now, what will be the percentage of the carbon and the hydrogen is the question that we are asking. The percentage of carbon will be out of 44 grams, it is 12 grams carbon. So, out of 1.517 grams, how much is the carbon that we need produce in this system? This is coming from 
0.5 grams of the substance. So, from 100 grams of the substance how much is going to be formed? If you work out this detail, this would correspond to 82.76 percent of carbon. Hydrogen you can simply subtract it from 100, but one can calculate the hydrogen also because the water content is known. Percentage of hydrogen out of 18, 2 grams of hydrogen is there from the molecular formula. This is present in 0.776 how much is present in hydrogen is present in the system. This is coming from 0.5 grams. So, out of 100 grams how much is the? This corresponds to 17.24 percent. So, the carbon content is 82 percent. The hydrogen content is equal to 17.24 percent. Now, we need to find out what is the m and n, the ratio of the carbon to hydrogen is what we need to find out. So, if one divides this by 12, this would correspond to 6.89 in terms of the number of carbons that is present. If we divide this by 1, that is the molecular weight of atomic weight of hydrogen and atomic weight of carbon, if we decide divide it, from the percentage you can calculate what would be the ratio of these two. So, the carbon hydrogen ratio is what we needed in this particular case 6.89 is to 17.24 is the ratio of carbon and hydrogen that is present here. So, if you normalize it by dividing it by 6.89 this would correspond to 1 is to 2.5. You cannot have a fractional stoichiometry. So, you multiply this by 4, this would correspond to 4 is to 10. So, the m is n is equal to 4, m is equal to 10. So, the compound corresponds to C 4 H 10. So, this is an illustrative example of how elemental composition or if the molecular weight is known for example, from the molecular weight you can calculate what would be the, this is the empirical formula that you have. If the molecular weight is 4 times the empirical weight, then it also corresponds to 4 is to 10 corresponding to butane as the. So, the elemental composition from the combustion experiment by calculating the carbon and hydrogen amount is given here. We will stop it at this stage, we will continue in the next session about estimation of nitrogen and other elements in organic compound hope this illustration was useful to you. So, in this module essentially we looked at the types of purification methods, sublimation, crystallization, distillation, extraction and chromatography and then the detection of elements that are present in the organic compound using the sodium fusion test and a few other tests that were discussed here. Thank you very much for your attention.